fantastic opportunity for me to see the, the workings of the, of the Catholic Church in its, in its heart, in its headquarters, in the, the Roman Curia. Um, and it's, it's, it's a glimpse behind some walls that we wouldn't normally um, get to see behind from, from a distance. Absolutely, the program was conceived really well. It really seems to address a lot of the issues that the press is really concerned about with this pontificate so far. So it's great to have some insights that you don't get otherwise they're not so easy to access. The point is I never expected that the people will be so open to all the questions that as a Muslim I wanted to know. I've been able to hear directly from major church leaders about the kinds of news that we're going to be covering in the next year uh, in this really interesting time in the church, but also just being able to be here in Rome and be saturated in these ideas, that's been incredibly helpful. Welcome to this year's edition of The Church Up Close. I'm Father John Walk, a professor of literature here at the Pontifical University of the Holy Cross and the School of Social Communications and the head of the Church Up Close program. This session uh, is being done mostly online. There are some people present in, in the aula here in the, the bowels of the university, but it, uh, for the most part, the audience is, uh, is following online. The School of Church Communications uh, exists here in Rome largely to, to form people who are going to be working in communications uh, in the church, but also offers programs for, for journalists to help journalists cover uh, the church here in Rome and, and around the world. And the Church Up Close program was designed essentially for people who are not in, in Rome there are other programs that are designed for journalists who are resident in Rome. The Church Up Close is for people who are covering the church from afar, and it's designed to offer them uh, insights, context, uh, perspective to help them in their, in their coverage of the church, to have a sense of the lay of the land here in Rome. And in this abbreviated version of the Church Up Close, which is usually a week long thing where people come and spend a week here in Rome, as you've seen in those images from the, from the video, due to COVID, it's being done uh, this year online. Next year, we intend uh, to be back in person with a week long Church Up Close program. Uh, before beginning uh, with today's session, I just want to thank um, the sponsor uh, of the Church Up Close, which is the our Sunday Visitor Institute. That, for those of you who are not uh, Americans, the our Sunday Visitor is the what's well, the only weekly Catholic newspaper uh, in the national newspaper in the, in the U.S. and it's one of the largest Catholic publishers in the world uh, in Huntington. Indiana. We're very grateful for the help that they've given us over the years in, in putting uh, these programs together. And today we have uh, the honor of having with us three of the, the most experienced journalists uh, covering the church here in Rome, representing print, radio, television, secular uh, journalism, uh, church-based journalism, uh, Sean Patrick Lovett, worked for many years in uh, Vatican Radio. Uh, John Allen has worked covering exclusively, essentially, the church for many years. Nicole Winfield works for 
Associated Press. It's a, vari a wide variety of perspectives uh, on the church that we're offering today, precisely to help those around the world, journalists around the world, get a take on what it's like to cover the church in Rome, things that they need to keep in mind, and insights that will help them see more clearly what the news that they're receiving from Rome. So as I, I was saying earlier, there's a certain uh, interpretive skill, a hermeneutic uh, that's necessary when, when reading news about the church, one has to have a certain amount of experience in understanding what's being said and what's not being said, and who is who and who counts. And I think some sense of that is conveyed in the Church Up Close programs and the people we choose to, to come address uh, uh, the journalists. And today at the end, there will also be time for, for questions. First, we'll just have a conversation among the three uh, of our guests relating their own experiences and challenges uh, here in Rome. And then there'll be time for, for questions from the audience that's present here today. Um, I want to just introduce um, John Allen, who will be sort of guiding this conversation. And he's one of my oldest and dearest friends in Rome. Uh, for many people, I'm sure John needs no introduction. Uh, many journalists, uh, his, his book on, on conclaves is uh, famous for being the, the journalist guide. You see journalists walking around Rome with the, with the conclave book uh, all the time. Uh, he hails from Hayes, Kansas. I suppose people have used that before to hail from Hayes uh, by way of Los Angeles and other places, but he's been here in Rome for 20 some uh, years, uh, first for the National Catholic Reporter, then for his, he was the founding editor of, of Crux. Uh, he's a familiar face also on CNN and has his own radio program. And then for all those, for those reasons, uh, he is, uh, I think, a perfect guide for this conversation, um, conversation among friends and colleagues about what it's like to cover the Vatican, not just in this age of Francis, but also within the broader perspective of many, well, 20 some years, I think everyone here has been here uh, covering three popes. And that, that gives us a broader perspective on the situation uh, of the church and the papacy today. With that, uh, pass the microphone to, to John Allen. <clears throat> Thank you, Father John. Uh, listen, what is the point of being someone's friend if you can't embarrass them in public, right? Uh, so let me say this about Father John Walk. In addition to being an exemplary priest, uh, a great man, a great friend, uh, a fine expert on communications and literature. I don't know if you know this about Father John Watt, but he also plays a mean rock guitar. Uh, and if you haven't had him do like Eagles Desperado for you some night, get him up on the roof of this building, lay out some libations, and I promise you, you will be rocking in the neighborhood. Uh, and I hope we will live stream all that and package it as a pay-per-view event. Uh, all right, uh, we are uh, really lucky this afternoon uh, to have with us uh, two people who are, are also friends of mine, but uh, also treasured colleagues whom I just respect enormously. And I, I think they are both in their own ways, the gold standard uh, of this business. Uh, I'll begin uh, on my right, your left, uh, with uh, Nicole Winfield of the Associated Press. Uh, Nicole is, first of all, a native New Yorker, uh, and I know her to be quite proud of that. Um, I remember when we were with Pope Francis when he went to the States, and of course he was in New York, D.C., and Philadelphia, and on the way back during that airborne press conference he always does. I will say this about flying on the papal plane. First of all, I hate it, and I love the fact that I no longer have to do it. Um, but I will give it this, the, the papal plane, the seats are awful, the food is terrible, but the in-flight entertainment is spectacular uh, in the Pope Francis era. And anyway, I remember we asked him about the three places he had been, right? Um, in Philadelphia and DC, he kind of phoned it in, but he was obviously really enthusiastic about New York. He actually made up a word. I don't remember what it was. Do you? I'm going to have to think about it, but he did. And I remember because he's a Spanish native speaker, 
making up a word in Italian. I'm a native English speaker. I had to solicit uh, uh, help from the the Italians on board, and and they confirmed that it was a made up word. It was um, straw something. Yes. Keep keep going. I'm well, anyway. going to come up with it because I, I I led the story with. Anyway, it. <laughs> the whole point is the Pope was so enthusiastic about New York, like however many thousand words there are in the, in the Italian language would not do it. Uh, he had to come up with something else. And I remember after that frenzy, when we were trying to figure out what the hell he meant, right? Uh, when we finally agreed, yeah, it's a made up word and it probably means this and all that. Later in the flight, I remember I, I walked past the seat that Nicole was sitting in and I looked down and just said something to Nicole, like, you know, what do you think? And she looked up at me with this like beatific vision and she said, the Pope really likes New York. Uh, and that obviously meant something to her. Uh, so, so that's point one. Uh, Nicole is a native of New York. She is a graduate of Johns Hopkins University. Uh, she's married to Vernon Silver, who is a senior reporter and very distinguished journalist himself uh, at Bloomberg News. And one of the signal facts about Nicole, a, a mom and a wonderful mom uh, to three kids. Um, she has, uh, she's, she joined AP in 1992, uh, before coming to Rome was at, uh, it was in Miami and at the UN, uh, in Rome, uh, she, well, I, I don't know if I should say primarily, but you cover the Vatican a lot. Uh, but in addition to that, uh, you also have other responsibilities. Uh, she's covered <laughs> conflicts in Afghanistan, Israel, the Palestinian territories, the Gulf. She was even involved in the coverage of the London Olympics. So she's been kind of, she, she knows the craft of journalism uh, from a variety of different points of view. I will say this about Nicole. I've seen lots of reporters come and go uh, in this beat in a variety of different languages. And you don't get to Rome typically by being stupid. I mean, most of the people, most of our colleagues typically are very gifted. Um, so no surprise that Nicole is extremely intellectually gifted. But uh, the, the other two qualities I associate with Nicole. Number one, she is absolutely tenacious in pursuit of a story. Um, and number two, utterly fearless. Uh, and, and those two qualities, I just, I think they make for a very special package. Um, so thanks, Nicole. Uh, to my left uh, and your right uh, is Sean Patrick Lovett. And, you know, Father Walk made a big deal uh, at the beginning of all this, that we've covered three popes. Nicole and I are youngins. Uh, Sean has been around five popes. Okay, five. Uh, okay, uh, she and I go back to JP2. You go back all the way to Paul the Saint, Paul the Sixth. Um, Sean was the director of the English language section of Vatican Radio for. What adjective do I want? I wish I could remember what the hell the Pope said because it would be perfect right now. Uh, a staggering. Stunning, uh, remarkable 43 years. Mm -hmm. You realize, Sean, that probably two thirds of the people listening to us right now weren't even born. I, I do you... realize that. Did, yeah. did, you didn't have to remind me, though. Um, thank you. Just the same. No, every time I think I've been around too long, I think of you and <laughs> thank you're, you, you're like the gift that keeps I, on giving. I knew I was going to have a good time here this uh, afternoon. You've just proved that. So he, uh, he, he had that gig from 1978 to 2020, obviously spanning five papacies which has given him a depth of insight and experience that is just, well, it's unsurpassed probably in, in absolute, but certainly in the English speaking realm, uh, it is unsurpassed. Uh, today, uh, Sean continues to be, to do, have a number of irons in the fire. He teaches communications and media studies at the Pontifical Gregorian University, which means you were hobnobbing with Jesuits on a semi-regular basis. For a long, long time. Yes. Do you get in on the daily cocktail hour? That's what I want to know. Um, love to tell. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and uh, he is also the vice president of the Center for Research and uh, Communication, uh, which to me, Sean, sounds like a CIA front, but <laughs> okay, whatever. Uh, it provides, ostensibly anyway, it provides freelance media consulting worldwide. Do I have and that right? Mostly in developing countries, yeah. Oh, mostly in developing, engineering coups and yes. things like that. <laughs> uh, all right, very good. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, the game plan here is uh, I'm going to sort of pose a couple of questions to prime the pump uh, among the three of us. Uh, and then we will open it up to your questions because we already know what we think. Uh, figuring out what you would like to know about and what your concerns are is always the best part of this. But just to kickstart things, let, let me ask uh, this group. 
what each of us thinks the trick to understanding the Vatican is. Like, what, what's the hardest part to, to penetrating this, you know, odd, mysterious world uh, of the Vatican? Uh, I'll, I'll begin with just giving you my own experience, and then you two can take it from there and, and give the right answer. <clears throat> you know, my experience is this. Uh, I ar arrived in Rome uh, in the 90s. Uh, as the freshly minted Vatican correspondent for the National Catholic Reporter, which is a Catholic newspaper based in the United States. Uh, it had never had uh, an actual Rome correspondent before. It had a guy, uh, an ex-Jesuit by the name of Peter Hubblethwaite, who wrote about the Vatican, but he did it from Cambridge. So in terms of having somebody in Rome, it was a novelty, right? Uh, so I came in with absolutely like nobody to teach me the ropes or, you know, there was no sense of institutional memory uh, because there's, there wasn't anything. <clears throat> so I came in with a bunch of naive assumptions that were very quickly debunked. Uh, I could go on for a long time about what they were, but I'll just give you one. Okay, I had assumed that because the Vatican is this, you know, global institution, uh, in a sense, embracing the entire world, that it would be like the UN, you know, that everything would be simultaneous translation and like one language would be as good as another and like learning Italian would be a hobby. So I didn't bother before I got here. I mean, I love to say my Italian was so bad when I got here, I thought Prego was a brand of spaghetti sauce. Okay, that's, that's where I was. Um, and I quickly learned that it's actually the most stubbornly monolingual environment on earth. Like, you know, uh, learning Italian is, is a sink or swim proposition. Uh, and experiences like that sort of began to pile up. And it occurred to me that at the beginning, at least, rather than thinking of this, like as a journalist tracking a particular story, right? Whatever the day's story was, like back then it was John Paul. So, you know, John Paul has just appointed so-and-so bishop or John Paul has just issued this decree that I had to back up uh, and I had to start with something much more basic, which was like cultural anthropology. Uh, I, I had to accept that the Vatican is its own culture uh, with its own languages and its own psychology and its own tribal patterns of behavior. And I had to think of myself as like Margaret Mead, right? <laughs> Coming of age in Samoa, like uh, encountering this exotic, weird, you know, uh, new culture and having to totally jettison my assumptions about how things should work uh, and just observe for a while mm -hmm. and, and watch the natives and, and figure out, you know, what made them tick. Like, what, what did they prioritize? Um, and how did they organize their lives, right? Uh, and sort of what made them tick. Uh, and to me, that, that was the trick of it, that in, in the Vatican, now I'm sure this is true on every beat, but this is really my only professional experience. I mean, I, I had a classic car column for six months in, in Southern California, but I can't even change my own oil. So, I mean, I was writing these pieces about a 67 Chevy as a metaphor for post-war at Los Angeles. <laughs> Not sure it made sense to anyone. Uh, so meaningfully, uh, my only professional experience is, uh, is covering the Vatican, and, and certainly in this realm. Culture is king. Uh, I think the, the threshold piece of advice, now I would give anyone, uh, who any journalist certainly, who, who wants to cover the Vatican, is basically forget anything you've ever done before. I don't care if you've covered a bishop's conference. This place does not work like a bishop's conference. Uh, I don't care uh, if you've covered City Hall. This place does not work like City Hall. And I don't care if you've covered the White House because it doesn't roll that way either. Um, it is a very unique little sort of cultural enclave. Uh, and, and the trick in my experience is like just being around and paying enough attention that you can begin picking up some of the lingo, some of the rhythms, some of the psychology. That, I need to warn you, is very much what mathematicians would call an asymptotic objective. You can get closer to it, but you never get quite there. I mean, maybe you did, 43 years, I mean, come on. But most of us never get all the way across the finish line. So anyway, that, that, that's my take, uh, is that you have to understand it is a culture unto itself. Uh, and, it, and it really can't be understood on the basis of assumptions borrowed from any other culture. It has to be developed from within.
Nicole, what do you think? Uh, I would tend to agree. Um, uh, I, coming from a US journalistic culture where you, a journalist can expect a certain level of responsiveness. Uh, there is a, an expectation of responsiveness from uh, people in public office. Um, that is not necessarily the case here, although it, you can get there, but it takes a while. I think there's a lot more um, uh, relationship building that has to happen until uh, certain um, skepticisms or, or, you know, I, I, I get that, you know, I'm, I'm the mainstream media. I'm not even Catholic media. I'm, I'm certainly not Italian Catholic media. So I've kind of got a few strikes against me as far as um, the institution is concerned. Um, but I think after you take the time to try to build relationships uh, with, uh, with people, they, you can, you can get, uh, you can get somewhere, but it is certainly not what you would expect when you you pick up the phone and call the press office, the mayor of your town, and expect an answer uh, for something. Um, I would also say that, as as John pointed out, that it is its own culture, um, and I think a journalist covering the Vatican gets um, can get some credibility by really studying at the very least the structure and the law that govern this place. I mean, it is its own country, it has its own law, it has its own bureaucracy. And just being familiar with the lingo and the, uh, the organization, literally the flow chart of who does what, um, what their competences are um, and what are the rules and the laws governing it that at least give you the, gives you the language to um, to be able to engage with uh, with the people on the inside, and let them realize that you are competent to 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 speak on their level. I mean, if you just come in and expect that you're going to get you know the head of the CDF to to respond to an email, um, you know, right off the bat, that's probably not going to happen. But between understanding the structure of the law and, and taking a little bit of time to build relationships, you can kind of break down the, unfortunately, <clears throat> there are um, some traditional longstanding cultural barriers of skepticism, um, especially I'd say toward, toward the secular media, perhaps uh, legitimate, not always, but- um, But it doesn't uh, really matter, they're there. They're there and you have to work around them. So that would be my... Uh... I'm really glad you hit on relationships because I think that is so important. I mean, I can, I can tell you from personal experience, I have learned far more about the Vatican uh, at Roman restaurants over lunch and dinner than I ever did like in a press conference or, or something like that. I mean, it is one of those environments where building relationships is absolutely essential. Now, Sean, you have a kind of interesting like insider outsider take on all this, right? Mm -hmm. Because you were of course a quote unquote Vatican official mm -hmm. for a very long time. In so far as such a thing exists, yeah. Yes, to the extent that, and then we can debate the metaphysics of right. that, but Fine. let's just take it for I the moment. Take it in, in yeah. inverted commas. And, yes. Yeah. Um, uh, but at the same time, uh, well, Vatican Radio, I mean, you obviously, uh, because of the nature of your work, you also understand very much how journalists experience the institution. Mm -hmm. And plus, you know all of us, and we're friends with you. And so you understand our travails. Um, so based on that unique, and I really do mean absolutely unique, treasure trove of experience to you, what's the trick to getting the Vatican right? Having a hefty expense account <laughs> uh, and being able to take a lot of people out to lunch and dinner. That's really, seriously, you, that's how you get to break the Vatican. Huh? But, but in terms of really being helpful to you, I mean, yes, I'm, I was always on the inside looking out. So you mentioned 1978. It was actually, I started working in 1977 for the Vatican. Um, Elvis Presley was still alive. A, um, a guy called George Lucas Are was still trying. 
stop it. <laughs> George Lucas was still trying to find funding for some crazy science odyssey movie called Star Wars. And a very young entrepreneur by the name of Steve Jobs was still trying to figure out what fruit to name his company after. That was the, that was the 1970s when I started working under, under Paul VI. It was just a year later when in August, Paul VI dies, John Paul I takes over and I do remember in terms of the inside looking out and, and dealing with journalists, I remember spending a long, long time on the phone with a foreign correspondent, charity doesn't allow me to say BBC, uh, to say <laughs> who, it, who it was, um, tr BBC, <clears throat> trying to explain why the Pope could still be the Pope even if he wasn't being crowned with a crown because that was the scandal. And I use the word specific, that was the scandal back in 1978, was how can the Pope be a Pope if he's not? This is John Paul I, right. who on the day before the so-called coronation comes out with this, I think we got it by, it was a roller stat. I, I don't expect anybody to know what that means. It was a precursor to the photostat, Never mind. It, it was, it was a, a piece of paper that we all got on our desks. And I, it said something to the, to the effect of, by express wish of the Holy Father, the first day of his pontificate will not be known as a coronation insofar as there will be no crown, but the inauguration of his pontificate. And the phone started ringing off the hook. Um, so try, trying to explain to someone in 1978, you know, that the crowns do not make popes. I, I remember having a similar conversation with another correspondent, maybe so, um, back in 2012, 13, when was Francis? 20, 2013. Thank you, 2013. When you get to my age, you remember things, but not in the order they happen. Um, 2013, I had a similar conversation with another correspondent over why the Pope refused to wear red shoes and could still be the Pope. So, you know, don't always think it's high flying explanations of papal encyclicals and things. It sometimes just comes down to clothing <laughs> and accessories. Okay. But I still think the best piece of advice is hefty expense, expense account. Okay, yeah, so that's the big takeaway from Sean, have a big expense <laughs> account. Editors everywhere, I hope you were listening um, because that is an excellent piece of advice. One we are increasingly less likely ever to see again in our lifetimes, but, uh, but a good one. Uh, all right, before we open it up to questions, let me put uh, another question to the group. Now, this is just period interest. I'm not sure there's any great journalistic lesson to be learned from any of this, but uh, one of the things about the Vatican, one of the delights uh, of this gig actually, is that um, the Vatican may be a small little thing, uh, but it's a window onto the entire world, right? Uh, so one day, I don't know, uh, you know, the new chancellor of Germany is here. So you're doing something about, you know, quo vadis Europe, right, uh, in the age of AUKUS. Uh, and the next day, Richard Gere is in town while he's on his way to testify in this trial against Salvini down in Sicily. Uh, and so you've got, you know, the Pope and pop stars. And I mean, in other words, there, you know, there, there's an organic connection to virtually everything under the sun. And you often find yourself meeting people, doing things, seeing things that you never thought you would, right? Um, so the question is, what would be among the most, I, I guess what I'm looking for is, what is the weirdest uh, or most surreal uh, experience that being on the Vatican scene has occasioned uh, for all of us? Again, I'll kickstart, I'll, I'll mm -hmm. give you mine um, to let you two think about that for a minute. Big hole sticking, don't expect um, it. Right? I need, I need <laughs> so, so here's a weird thing that happened to me. Uh, this is uh, 2001. Okay, so we had 9 11, obviously. We just celebrated the 20th anniversary. Uh, John Paul II went to Kazakhstan shortly after that. I think it was nine days later, uh, if I remember correctly. Um, and, you know, it was a keenly anticipated trip because, uh, well, the American psychology is that Kazakhstan and Afghanistan must be like right next to each other. Uh, in fact, Kabul is about, I don't know, like 400 miles uh, from Astana, the capital of Kazakhstan. But nevertheless, it was the same neighborhood. And anyway, it was going to be John Paul's first public event since 9-11. 
right? Uh, and so everybody was very interested in what he was going to have to say. So there was a lot of press interest. Now, I was not on the papal plan for that flight. So I actually went to Kazakhstan in advance uh, and then stuck around for a little bit after the trip is over. So in advance, uh, the Kazakhstan, whatever it was, Ministry for Communication, which I'm sure 10 years earlier had been the Ministry for Propaganda, uh, had organized this flying tour of uh, the country for journalists, because Kazakhstan's a big place, right? Uh, so they organized this flying tour of the country for journalists who were on hand to cover the Pope. And so they came into our hotel the, where most journalists were staying and said, okay, uh, you know, tomorrow we have this flying tour for you. And we looked at the schedule and they were taking us to like a factory to see the glories of Kazakhstan steel production uh, and like a farm to see their agricultural output. And we had to point out, look, most of us cover religion. Okay, we're, we're not interested in seeing factories. You, you got to put something on there that'll... So they threw on an Orthodox church in a mosque. Okay, but we still had, by the way, we, st we still had to go to the factory and the farm. Uh, but they threw on a, uh, a, a church in a mosque. So that meant we made four separate stops this day. Now, so that morning, we all file onto the plane. There may, because not everybody went. There are maybe 20 of us who went. Uh, most of them were Italians. There were a couple of Spaniards, uh, a couple of French, a Brit or two, I think. Uh, and I, I, as it turned out, I was the only American on the plane. I didn't really think much about that uh, until we got to our first stop. Um, and bear in mind, this is nine days after 11. Okay, This is back when the whole world sympathized with the United States, and, right? and the whole world felt this sense of loss. Um, so we landed and uh, some guy from the Ministry of Communications says, could you please keep your seats for a moment? And then he goes out the, the, the door of the plane and goes down. And then there was a guy there in a sash who I'm sure was like the mayor or the governor or something. And he whispers something in this guy's ear. And I realized afterwards he was saying, there's an American on the plane. So, Instead of just having a generalized greeting for the whole group, what they did is this, the, the mayor with the sash gets, they have us come over and, and then he gets up on the stage and he says, you know, and it was translated for me. And it's like, on behalf of autonomous prefecture number 47, uh, I would like to tell you how heart sick all of our people are at the losses that have been experienced in the United States. Uh, you know, we, we hope and pray for all of your loved ones. And we just want you to know how much you, we are with you right now. And then I'm beckoned up on stage. And all of a sudden, I become de facto the ambassador of the United States in this place. Uh, and so I'm standing there on this stage saying, well, on behalf of a grieving nation, uh, you know, I want to tell you how much your sympathy means to us. And this played itself out four times during this day. Uh, and then, so the final stop is the farm. And obviously somebody called ahead, okay? Because they, they pulled out all the stops. Um, so they put us on this flatbed truck and drive us out into this open wheat field where there's this huge tent, right? And, and they have prepared this huge feast, right? Um, and, and they are obviously roasting something on a spit, okay? Uh, and then there's the same ceremony. There's a platform. Some guy gets up and, you know, on behalf of the farmers of this prefecture, uh, you know, I want to acknowledge we have a brother American with us and, you know, blah, blah, blah. We are so sorry. Uh, and to demonstrate our respect and love for you in this moment, uh, we are going to give you a great honor. We want you to have the ceremonial first bite of the goat. And the ceremonial first bite of the goat was the ear. Okay. So some guy takes out a scythe, right? And like whacks off the ear of the goat, steaming hot, uh, and puts it on this plate, right? And brings it. And now I got like 400 farmers staring at me, waiting for me to bite into this like roasted goat's ear. And, I, you know, I don't know about the rest of you. In America, we often say something tastes like chicken. Something weird tastes like chicken. 
I'm here to tell you roasted goat's ear does not taste like chicken. Okay, uh, it tasted like biting into a rubber tire. The only, thing West, saved West, it John, is, you know that, the only thing that saved it is by that point in the day, we had had to down so many toasts of vodka that mm -hmm. I'm not sure I would have tasted it no matter what <laughs> the, the actual taste of it was. My point uh, is that I'm a kid who grew up in a trailer in rural Western Kansas, okay? And, you know, a uh, single parent, and didn't have very much uh, growing up um, and fairly limited horizons, to be honest with you. And here I am 30 years later, the de facto ambassador of the United States eating the ceremonial first bite of roasted goat in a wheat field in Kazakhstan. Um, that is not a trajectory you hear about very often. Um, and it's, it's only because through a series of just dumb luck, uh, I ended up in this gig for it really is true. It's not just a job, it's an adventure. <laughs> so that's my story. Uh, Sean, what do you get? <laughs> but do, do you want serious or, or funny surreal? Uh, let's go funny surreal. Oh, well, okay. Okay. Um... I was prepared for serious surreal, but that's just because okay, well, I'm a serious, serious guy. No, I can give you both uh, with two different popes. All right. Like. Okay. Same yeah. price. Well, um, you got 43 years to pick from, man. I so, mean, yeah. No, I mean, if, if I know, I'm sitting. Thanks for, for giving us time to, to think about it, right, Nicole? It was yeah, really okay. useful. I'm, I'm, I'm so, so, so much. So, I mean, if I think, if I think serious surreal uh, immediately, uh, May 13th, uh, 1981, oh, assassination course. attempt, John Paul two in St. Peter's Square, that has to be the serious surreal, but really surreal, no one believed it. Could happen, would happen, did happen. Um, but you want funny surreal? Um, this is a funny surreal with Benedict the There are not many funny surreals <laughs> right. with Benedict the Sixteenth. but uh, we're in the Holy Land and we're on Temple Mount and uh, we're visiting the Blue Mosque and we're all asked to take our shoes off, of course, before we enter. <laughs> And we do the tour of the mosque and we come out the other side. And meanwhile, someone has moved the shoes. And there's this marvelously surreal moment with cardinals and bishops and dignitaries playing tug of war with their shoes. <laughs> no, this is mine. No, it's not. I saw it first. This is mine. That's, uh, yeah. It was, I do kind of tend to come back to clothing all the time, don't I? I'm sorry, there, there are other stories to tell, but I'm sure Nicole has a better one. Um, uh, I'm going to go back to um, your comment about New York, if I may. And I believe the word was stralimitata. That's it, stralimitata. So beyond all limits, yeah. New York. Yeah. And um, for me, that arrival in New York was particularly surreal. And I would point out that I think there's a constant here, which is that the trips that we are privileged to go on um, are some of the most extraordinary experiences that a journalist can ever have. When you are in a bubble of a pool, a traveling pool, be it in the White House, you know, if, if you've ever got to do that, it is, it's a pretty great, um, it's an exhausting thing, but it's a pretty great experience because you are seeing the institution or the person that you cover uh, in, in fairly unusual circumstances uh, and you're learning about the place where you're going um, uh, to boot. And so it's, I think it's no uh, coincidence that all three of us have um, uh, come up with the most extraordinary experiences from our, our trips. Um, and, but the New York one was particularly good to me because when we arrived, the plane touched down uh, at JFK. There was a high school band on the tarmac um, playing New York, New York. Uh, and I still have a video. In fact, it just came up on my Facebook feed as a memory because it was in these days, that right. trip. Right. Um, and so all of the Vaticanisti were on the tarmac dancing um, to, to, this, uh, to this high school band. And then the killer thing was that we board the, um, the buses to go into the city because we were staying at a... Um, uh, what was it at Hilton? No, the Marriott, Marriott. at Marriott in Times Square. Times Square. Yeah. We had a police escort taking us down the Van Wyck Expressway through the tunnel, 
down 34th Street, two times square, I have never made that trip from JFK into the city as quickly as we did or with as little traffic as possible. And for a New York native to have a police escort going into town was pretty extraordinary. And to my left, I remember I was sitting in the front seat and to my left was Phil Pulella from Reuters, um, who is also a New York native. And he was acting as tour guide. He had taken the microphone and was pointing out all of the sites along the way to our uh, our fellow colleagues. So that was that was uh, fun and extraordinary for for personal reasons. But um, I would say the craziest experience on a Pope trip was when we were flying. I forget which inner point, but we were in Chile on an in in country flight. And the journalists are all in the back of the plane, the delegations in the front of the plane. And at some point, word gets back to us that the Pope has just married two flight attendants. And you can imagine <laughs> the, um, how, uh, the, the excitement and the frustration of the press corps trying to get someone from the front of the plane to come back to us to indeed tell us if this indeed was the case. Um, and in, it was, and we ended up conducting a press conference with the two newlywed flight attendants kind of perched on an armrest in the back of the plane, um, who, so uh, uh, anyway, we, we, we wrote, all wrote stories about the charming story of the two flight attendants who the Pope had just married, you know, in the cockpit, um, and I, if I'm not mistaken, I think they had they were going to be married, but there was if it was the earthquake or something yeah. that had um, yeah. disrupted their planes. Anyway, it was this crazy feel good story um, at an otherwise very problematic trip uh, for the Pope. But, um, you know, to be able to write I, that was pretty that was pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> Of course, in the infinite capacity of social media to turn even the most beautiful things yes. into toxins. It became uh, toxic. I remember immediately after that, this big thing broke out on social media about whether the Pope is being irresponsible because pastor is supposed to do marriage prep and how did he... Yeah, but by the time we landed, it yeah. was <laughs> it had all yeah. gone downhill. Yeah. But it was, uh, it was my fun. basic advice is, you know, after you post a story, don't check your Twitter feed for 72 <laughs> hours because your your mental health will improve. Uh, all right. Uh, so we want to open this up to questions from uh, the people who are with us here. Um, so what do we have, Danny? Sure. Play, if you could identify yourself uh, and then if you're directing your question, anyone in particular say so. Sure. Well, the question really is a double question for for you three. You mentioned at the beginning. Identify yourself, please. Yes, sir. <laughs> Daniel, and I teach here at the School of Church Communications. And I've been in Rome also for a long time, but not covering as a journalist, but more in the teaching, in the teaching side. Um, you both, or you, some of you mentioned the, this idea of the need of picking up the culture of the Vatican, the culture of the site. No? But I'm sure that there is something possible to do before that. I mean. What advice would you give for a journalist from a formation or educational point of view if somebody's going to come to a place like this besides uh, learning from the culture? How can he prepare yeah, before they get here? Yeah. Before they get here. And the uh, second, uh, next to, I mean, attached to this, um, this mo most of the things that you mentioned are related also to journalists who are based in Rome. No? But certainly, uh, most of the journalists come occasionally you know, for conclave, for a beatification for a particular event. No? Is, it, is there any hope for a journalist who just comes for a few days to cover the Vatican? Can he or she understand, pick, pick up something of the, what is going to happen? Okay. Well, Nicole, maybe if you could handle the first one. For somebody who, who is coming over here to cover the Vatican but isn't here yet and they want to gear up, what would your advice be? Um, I'd say if you have... Italian reading skills. I mean, there is a lot that gets written about the Vatican. A lot of it's in Italian. Um, enough of it, though, I think at this point is in English that you can probably get a pretty good crash course reading folks like John at Crux and all of the good Crux coverage. Um, there are other, you know, Catholic media, um, the tablet, the register. I don't want to leave anyone out. Catholic News Service, Catholic News Agency. I mean, they're um, don't, don't take my limited listing. Um, 
um, but you know, I think the 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 media, uh, the specialized Catholic media, does does cover the Vatican very closely, and so you can at least immerse yourself um, in in that. Um, I think if you're coming from a uh, you know coming in and parachuting in. Um, if you are able to find, obviously, um, church men uh, or, or, or sisters from your country might be more receptive to having a coffee with you if you um, reach out to them in advance. So let's say through your local bishop or your religious order that you, you know, who educated you, um, if you can just get a name uh, an entree uh, in Rome that can open doors for you. Arriving cold is not advisable. Sometimes you have no choice, um, but even one one name can um, who you can take out for a coffee or something more if you have that expense account um, that can at least give you um, a baseline and hopefully lead to more um, connections, because it's all about what they say in Italian is raccomandazione, you know, this person presents you to this person and, and you kind of get a chain reaction of introductions. Um, and hopefully it leads to somewhere where you want to go. Um, so yeah, so read up, try to make contact um, with, I've, I have, I've, I would imagine, I, I, I guess I don't have recent experience with this, but normally, if you're a journalist from the Philippines, you're going to, and if you can find, you know, a Filipino sister who's been here for years or someone in one of the congregations, that might be the entree that you need. Okay. And then Sean, so for journos who are not based here full time, but parachute in for big events, uh, the conclave would be the paradigmatic one, but other big events, like be it, you know, a canonization or something. Uh, who do not have time to develop 43 years of insights and connections. Uh, what's your advice? Uh, how do you get up to speed fast? And what's the best way, if you're only going to be here a week, best way to make use of that time? You mean apart from reading your books? <laughs> right, yeah. Uh, no, I, Nicole already, she answered the question beautifully and comprehensively. And I should have added Vatican News. You, well, yeah, I know, I know you, you, you meant to, but I you just did to. now. So that Sorry, was that was good of you. No, the, no, the sense that the, there is a lot of material out there. There's some wonderful Vatican journalists and, and church sources. And, and not just because you're sitting next to me, because I also I read Crux and you really do a good job, an objective job. Uh, you do some wonderful analysis um, in terms of trying not just the who, what, when, and where, but the why, which is so important. And then the relationships that you spoke about earlier, I mean, that's, that's what it is, expense account or no expense account, but making those connections, um, you need to know someone. Huh? You, you, you can't be expected to know everything, but you are expected to know someone who knows something. And then there are lots of us around, and we're, we're great people, and uh, we're, you know, we're a cheap lunch. And um, so, yeah. And, and you know, Danny, the other thing I would say is don't be afraid of being an outsider. Um, because, I mean, those of us who do this all the time, I mean, over time, we, t we, we take a lot of stuff for granted because it's just second nature to us, and, and we don't bother explaining it. Um, but, of course, most of the people for whom we are writing or for whom we are speaking or whatever, don't have that frame of reference, right? And so sometimes an outsider with a fresh set of eyes can ask some really smart questions um, that, that wouldn't have occurred to us, right? I mean, I know I've, I've been in situations where somebody who just rolled in here, you know, asked a question that, well, of course that's the obvious question, but it just never, it didn't occur to people who just live, eat and breathe this stuff all the time. May I just add something? Was, uh, we were chatting Please, earlier John, with, yes. with, uh, with Father John. I know that on the previous session, on the 23rd, Cardinal Pell was, was a guest, and I was chatting to uh, a friend who watched that webinar, that, that session, and was quite surprised to discover that Cardinal Pell had been let out of prison. <laughs> um, and this is, this is a Catholic. Yeah. Uh, so just to say that so much so they assume we take for live ground. streaming we, from a prison in not australia not, no called not right. not called holy cross university yeah, yeah. anyway um so much that you know we we do take for granted is is not so obvious. i know right i i'm constantly in this right
Uh, yes, Ambassador, please. Again, if you could identify yourself and then give us your question. Good afternoon. Thank you very much indeed. My name is Chris Trott. I am the relatively recently arrived British ambassador to the Holy See. And I've, I've been here just about long enough to see that this is an extremely complicated place. You've talked about the Vatican as being sort of rather monolithic in the way you've described it. But I'm trying to get my head around hundreds of different congregations, hundreds of different academies, or what feels like hundreds of different universities and things. How, how do you approach the sort of the entirety of, of this, this grouping of institutions to make sense of that as you try to explain that back to your readers uh, in, in, your, in your home countries? Because I have exactly the same challenge in that I'm supposed to explain to the British government how all this fits together and what the keys are within this maze of different institutions that makes it all work as a single body. Yeah, well, I'll, I'll give you my two cents and then I'll open it up to my colleagues. Um, many years ago in a book uh, that I did called All the Pope's Men, uh, I had this section on myths about the Vatican. Um, and the very first one is that there is such a thing called the Vatican. Uh, in the sense that we use it in an English language conversation, because you know you will often hear people say the Vatican wants X, or the Vatican is hoping Y, or the Vatican is afraid of Z, right? As if there's an animal out there called the Vatican that has a central nervous system and thinks only one thought at a time. Uh, whereas, you know, in reality, as you just uh, unpack, uh, the Vatican is an extraordinarily complex bureaucracy. Um, that encompasses a variety of different points of view and experience and instincts and outlooks. So, you know, for every time somebody tells me uh, the Vatican is clericalist, well, sure, there are plenty of clericalist types in the Vatican, but I can name a truckload of people who don't cohere to that stereotype. Or the Vatican is conservative. And that's not so, so popular these days, but, you know, it used to be uh, the standard take uh, on the Vatican. Again, uh, you know, I could name plenty of people who, who don't fit that. So, uh, I think that that certainly is an important thing to understand, uh, that there is tremendous internal diversity. You know, I talked about the Vatican having its own culture. You could almost say that every day Casper has its own culture. I mean, Sean, working at Vatican Radio is a very different experience mm. from working at the Congregation for the Faith, right? Um, yes, yes, uh, we, yes, just in terms of the tools that we use and the, the, the oh, messages. Well, that's that that not the only difference, we, but uh, I mean, certainly the range the of internal, we, yes. the range of internal theological views you might tolerate at the radio is probably a little broader uh, than it might be in the holy office. Anyway, point is, uh, yes, uh, it is tremendously diverse uh, and appreciating that diversity is important. And, and look, I mean, that does make your task, anybody who's just starting out trying to get their hands around this, that does complicate their task because, you know, you may feel like you finally got your hands around the Secretary of State, but that doesn't really help you very much with, say, the Congregation for Worship or whatever, okay? Um, and, and that can be threatening, like, it, it does mean there's more to learn, um, but there is a positive side to that, too. Um, which is that every, for every negative stereotype you have about the Vatican, there are plenty of people who actually don't meet it. Um, and for every issue you care about, you're gonna be able to find somebody in the system who cares about it too, right? Uh, no matter what it is. Uh, and, and so there are, you, you have more, I guess what I'm trying to say is, you have more friends than you think. Uh, sometimes they're not very vocal, sometimes they're very carefully hidden. Um, but they are always there. Uh, and I think that's also part of the fun. Right. Um, I guess I would um, answer that question with the way I have tried to understand it. And it goes back to, I think, one of the points I made earlier, which is if you think of the, the Vatican and the Curia as a government, you have different departments you know, in the same way that in the American government, you have the State Department, the Pentagon, you know, Treasury, they all work more or less independently, because they all have their own things that they have to do. In the US system, you have a cabinet meeting where they all come together and actually talk and coordinate. And there's a president who, in the, in, in the presence of others, is, is setting policy. That's where 
this is different because you never have cabinet, maybe once every year or two, you'll have a cabinet meeting, but the Pope has one-on-one -on -one meetings with his cabinet secretaries, but there's really no, no way other than the secretary of state that weaves them together. And so you probably do have these bilateral communications and cooperations among the, the congregations, but, and this is a criticism of the Holy See that I imagine the long awaited reform is, is going to try to address that everyone's kind of siloed, right? That everyone has such separate competencies um, that often you don't need to consult. You know, Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith doesn't necessarily need to consult with actually APSA much. Um, in the end, they probably should, and, and I guess they, they, they do, but I tend to think of it, I look at it as a government and a government where you do not necessarily have the weekly cabinet meeting that sets policy per se, but does it a different way with the Pope having one-on-one -on -one meetings with his cab cabinet secretaries and then internal uh, communications uh, among them. Um, I don't know if that's accurate, but that's that's the only way I can make sense of it. Um, I think that's entirely accurate. Although, you know, I mean, ironically, that silization you're talking about was itself a product of a reform. Uh, it, it happened in the 19th century to solve a perceived problem then of, uh, well, what we would call today the castery shopping. What would happen back then in the era of the Papal States uh, is if you wanted something from the Vatican, you would go to one dicaster, and if you didn't get the answer you wanted, you would go to another, and you would just keep going until you got it, because they all had vaguely defined competencies, and they all thought they could pretty much do anything. Um, and to solve that problem, they built these walls around all of the dicasteries with these Uber defined competencies um, and actively discouraged communication among them precisely to try to short circuit that bit. And it, it's a great example sometimes of the cure being worse than the disease because you know what you end up with is exactly what you described. So uh, Sean, what about you? What about me? I mean, for ages as, as a teacher, as a lecturer on, on uh, communications, church communications, sometimes the biggest problem is just helping people understand the difference between the Vatican, the Holy See, and the Catholic Church. Uh, that, that's <laughs> to begin. And then, of course, within, yes, the Holy See and the Vatican, the, the, uh, you're actually lucky that you're, you're coming in now. If you'd, if you'd come in before some of the reforms, for example, having to deal with something like Vatican media, you would have had to deal with nine different, distinct, autonomous departments according to where you wanted to get your photograph of the audience you had with the Pope, uh, a, a copy of the recording you did with Vatican Radio, etc., etc. Nine departments which have now been fused into, into one. So you know things things are getting getting better and, and reforms are are happening in, in the Vatican's own own pace. Uh, in terms of advice, don't chuckle at uh, um, you should just put Vatican and pace in the same sense. Well, it invites you know, a it's, You've been 43 years. You start, you, you start to think slowly. <laughs> um, just in terms, of, in terms of advice, it's it's almost impossible to make sense. I mean, even after all that time for me to make sense of what it, of what the Vatican or the Holy See is and what it does, does. I think at the end of the day, what you do is you look for something or a department um, that reflects common interest, something that you care about very much. You're going to find a dicastria department, a group of people who are equally concerned or get excited or passionate about that topic. And, and that's, the, that's the entrance, that's, that what, that's what gets you in. And then from there, it sort of dovetails and, and, and wonderful things happen because at the end of the day, it is a wonderful place, isn't it? Yes, it's the magical kingdom. Uh, all right, other questions, Father John. Um, I guess I wanna take advantage of having so many years of experience in, in front of us and do kind of a, an impromptu improvised longitudinal study, right? Of how do you perceive subjectively, this is not statistical, so the trends in the themes of, of news stories in the different papacies and how, how have things changed? What was, you know, the major stories, uh, we were writing a ton about this during that time, and now we're writing about this. 
have there are there trend lines that you know, can be identified are you, are you in your in your own writing for instance that you've become expert on something that you know earlier wasn't a, wasn't really a topic or things like that nicole um i think um very often in regular news coverage um the journalist obviously can't necessarily dictate the trends because the trends happen and you know so there are external actors that create news stories uh, and you just kind of exhaust it by by writing about it so obviously there have been moments in all three papacies where sex abuse has been mm -hmm. you know the only thing we write about for a year two years three years on end um and each papacy has had that and and some of them more than one peak um so but that was um you know again nothing that we generated necessarily but in the broader culture there were you know reports started coming in in, in x country and y country and that created a momentum that we had to um then kind of jump on the bandwagon uh and and report out from here um same thing um you know i don't think i had written about the latin mass since 2007 um and then all of a sudden you know we we knew that um we knew that something was coming or we we thought something was coming uh with with francis to kind of um maybe rein it in um but now that's your are so you know it's it's a as a journalist, you have to you have to follow the the news when it happens. So the Pope, you know, issues a new motu proprio that changes things. Now with social media, you have the very voluminous um, reaction uh, that has ensued, and that and you have you know members of the hierarchy chiming in. So it 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 creates its own momentum that we you have to not you have to keep up with um so again it's it's an external uh news event that that generates its own um development and you just have to keep following the story um i guess in this papacy it began in 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 benedict's papacy but the financial reforms um, um and for me, at least, that's a hard story to sell uh, to a general secular news audience. Um, oh, but it's, you know, important. I know for Santa Croce, it's very important. Um, so, um, so we're 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 on that now. Um, but yeah, usually it's it's external events or the Pope saying or doing something, and then we just kind of jump on on the train. John? Again, John, how, how to, from the inside looking out, I mean, the job was depending, yes, on, on each papacy. Um, wow. Um, getting in in the morning and seeing what has happened. Did the Pope do it? You know, what did he dream about last night? And uh, making sure that gets out into the world. Um, a lot of Pope Benedict's papacy was waking up in the morning and filling the fire bucket and throwing water on the potential conflagrations uh, because what he had said or how he had said it did not appeal to uh, the general populace. Um, so yes, my gosh, I mean, uh, people often ask me, who's your favorite Pope? You know, it's, it's almost like asking you, Nicole, which is your favorite of your three children? Uh, you. <laughs> Don't, don't, don't answer that, it's a rhetorical question. Um, it's, you love them all, you, you, you know them all, um, but it's, it's different because, because they're different, because you relate to them differently, because each one is telling you a different story and, and, and you're trying to, to cope with who they are and trying to be uh, honest and, and, and truthful in, in helping them to communicate that story. So, I, uh, Father John, I know you were asking, do we know trend lines in the kinds of stories we cover? I'm, you know, as I was listening to Cole and Sean talk, I was trying to think. I mean, the truth of it is, I think in the main, the kinds of stories we are doing today 
more or less are the same kinds of stories that I was doing when I got here 25 years ago. I mean, you know, some of it is the Pope and foreign policy. Some of it is internal church debates, many of them the very same debates uh, over things like women's role in the church and, and how do we square our teaching on marriage with outreach to people who don't share that teaching. And so, you know, I mean, I mean, as you well know, the debate over communion for divorced and remarried Catholics was very active in the church when I got here in the mid 1990s. Uh, and then it went in deep freeze for a while and then came back with a vengeance. So, you know, in terms of the content of the stories, I'm not sure what, what I would say is just, I notice a difference in the volume uh, of stories being done. Uh, I remember, you know, my first couple of years covering the Vatican, like if something had happened in the Vatican the day before, right? Like John Paul put out a statement about something. Uh, if I got up the next morning and I read a couple of the leading Italian Vaticanisti, so back in the day, if I had read what Giancarlo Zizola had on it and Luigi Acatoli had on it, um, and then to see how it was being covered in English, you know, I would read the AP, uh, you know, I would read Reuters. Um, and I felt I had touched all the bases. I mean, once I had done that, uh, or maybe whatever was in Lavinia, right? I don't know. Uh, but once I had done that, I really felt, okay, more or less, uh, I now know what's going on. I understand how it's being perceived, how it's being covered. I've got a grip on it, right? Like today, you still you should do all of those things that I just said. Certainly read the Associated Press if it's Nicole's byline. Um, but, uh, and, and she actually, she has tremendous colleagues too. So anybody's byline. Um, but uh, in any event, uh, but now, you know, uh, you've got to check 20 people's Twitter feed. Uh, and there are like 30 blogs you have to read, uh, or at least people think you have to read them. Um, and, you know, you're getting, getting bombarded with stuff uh, from, our, from a variety of different quarters. Um, now, in one way, that, that's tremendous because it speaks of interest in the beat. Um, and it speaks of just the passion that people feel about this stuff. But in another way, it, it just makes it much more difficult, I think, to feel like you are on top of the discussion of any particular subject. And of course, by the time you've mastered the discussion of that subject, something else has happened anyway, right? Uh, so that I guess that would be the main trend that I perceive is just the volume of stuff that is out there. And I think that corresponds to the fact that there is also an increasing diversity in just people's perspectives on what's going on. Like, I, I don't exactly mean what they think, you know, people always had different opinions about you know, whether the Pope should zig or zag. But I mean, what, what they actually perceive is happening um, because there are so many different outlets who emphasize so many different things and who provide such radically different takes that it's increasingly difficult to have a baseline with, with your readership, even in terms of what they think like is, is going on right now, right? Uh, and, and therefore what they are expecting to find in your page, you know? I mean, Almost every day, I will get some email or WhatsApp or, you know, whatever from somebody who will say, you know, how in the world uh, is your top story today not X? Usually something I've never heard of. Um, and then when I peel back the onion, I find out, well, there's some Catholic blog in the States that is banging a drum about this. Uh, and therefore, there is some segment of the population that is all worked up about it. Right, uh, and if you were to ask them what's going on in the Vatican, you would get a very different take, right, from somebody who's consuming Vatican news, for instance, right. So th that would be a trend line, I would notice. Hmm. Uh, so uh, let us see what time are we. So we've got time for another couple of questions. Uh, Sean Patrick mentioned just to follow up. Sean Patrick mentioned the. Waking up in the morning, and what what's the the narrative of of this mm -hmm. papacy? And I was wondering if is is there a way that you would characterize um, the last let's say three uh, the narrative that was being sold in each of those papacies, John Paul, Benedict, and Francis? Because mm -hmm. obviously there is a sense in which the Vatican wants to tell a story it sees itself as being part of a, a narrative. And each papacy, I think, has its own self-understanding of, of where, we're, where we're headed or where we ought to be headed. Is there an, a way of describing perhaps the, 
the not, stories of yeah, these papacies not, as not in, not, by in them. Two, not in two minutes, Father John. Um, but why limit it to three? Um, no, no, sincerely, it's, it's, let's remember, I mean, you know, I, I, it's honestly and truly, St. Paul VI, um, John Paul I, um, just to wrap, so what did they, what did they teach, me? what did I get out of the narrative? Of course, I was, I was young and innocent, I was, I was learning, I, very, very simply, Paul VI, the narrative to me was the dignity of the papacy. And then everything that he did and everything he said and the way he was and the whole sedia gestatoria and, and, and the gloves and the, the distancing and the, the mystique and the, and the royal plural, we ourselves are pleased that you could be here today. All, all of this to me was the narrative, was the dignity of the papacy. Along comes John Paul I and he knocks all this out um, and the narrative becomes the humility of the papacy. Literally the opposite. No more sedia gestatoria, no more crowns, no more uh, the simplicity and the humility of the so much of those 33 days um, are, are echoed in the papacy of Francis. There, there are things that Francis does and Francis says all the way down to God is not only our father, but our mother too. John Paul I said that in 1978. He said it twice. Uh, scandal. Uh, today, it's, yeah, of course, obviously God is our father and our mother. You know? But, yeah, the simplicity of humanity. St. John Paul II, what did he teach me? Well, geography, um, the joys of first-class travel. Um, but the power of gesture, this, this, going, this going out and 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 physically being there where people are that power of gesture um the first pope i ever hugged was john paul the uh, second benedict the power of listening because you had to listen and you have to if you want to get the message one reading isn't enough a superficial you know list you've, you've got to go back you've got to read it twice you've got to listen very very carefully if you want to catch the narrative. Francis is still teaching us, but, and it sounds weird to say at a time of pandemic, but to me, it's the power of touch. Uh, the, the, the importance of, again, the, the, the literal being there and reaching out to people where they are, how they are, um, in a way that is appropriate to them. I've, I've always thought, Nicole, you know, the, have you seen what he does with pregnant women, uh, where he touch, kisses the tummy and, bless, I mean, if, if I did it, they'd lock me up, <laughs> but, but he, can, he can get away. All, all those things, those, those just embracing disabled people, um, this, this openness to human touch, which at this particular moment in, our, in time, I think is really under threat uh, for so many reasons. There you go. I hope that's some sort of answer for you. Nicole? Um, I would, I, uh, I'm going to limit this to the last two papacies, um, and I'm going to quote Father Lombardi, who has a lovely anecdote um, to describe the differences in Benedict and Francis, um, and he tells it this way. Whenever um, the Pope has a, a private audience with the head of state, um, Father Lombardi would go up to the library afterwards uh, to talk to the Pope to find out what elements he could put in the press statement um, to summarize um, what was discussed. And Father Lombardi recalls that when he would go to see Benedict, um, Benedict would say, we discussed this, one, two, three, and he said, A, B, C, and I replied, D, E, F. And so Father Lombardi had a very clear um, idea of the, the issues, who said what, and what the response was. Um, and he said that with Francis, um, he would say, Holy Father, you know, can you tell me uh, what, what shall we put in the press statement? And um, Pope Francis would say, oh, he, I, we had a very good relationship. He's a very, he's a good man. I, I could really connect well with him. So it's, it is a different way of relating to people, um, probably the same 
actual issues were discussed, but for Francis, the important thing to, or the thing that came first to mind was, as Sean said, the, um, the, the personal connection um, and or lack thereof, I guess, um, with the person who he was meeting that day. Um, and I think that goes, um, that, that we feel that when we're covering them. Um, as you said, I mean, Benedict was an intellectual pope. I mean, those, you really had to read it two or three times and it was dense and he did not speak in sentences, but in entire paragraphs. And you kind of had to work with it to, to translate it in at least into a, a language that was accessible to a non-Catholic, non-specialized uh, readership. Francis is a much more, he's much more um, colloquial. Um, so it's, you know, for, it's an easier, I guess, you don't need to be a theologian to, um, to be able to crank out a news story with Francis, but the substance more or less is the same. It's just delivered differently. Um, and, um, but again, I'm, I'm, I've always been struck by Father Lombardi's, um, I mean, he had such a privileged view uh, of those two and it, it seemed a very concise way of describing how each one related to, um, at least to the, to, to, to topics that I at least needed to, to write about in my work. So Father Jen, you asked differences in the narratives that popes are trying to sell about themselves. I, I generally don't believe popes are actually personally trying to sell a narrative about themselves. And I wish the Vatican collectively were organized and smart enough to try to sell a coherent narrative about a particular pope, but it generally doesn't work that way. But uh, I, I, I will say that I, I think each of the three popes that each of the three popes I have seen, they do have clearly different narratives. Uh, I think that's largely just by force of who they are and, and circumstance and so on. Um, and I think that's true both in terms of their personality and also what you might call their policy agenda, right? Their priorities, right? So in terms of personality, I mean, I've always found it helpful to think about John Paul II, Benedict XVI, and Francis in terms of musical genres. So to me, John Paul is like heavy metal. Uh, he's like Metallica, he's like pump up the noise, you know, loud, brash, in your face all of the time, right? Benedict XVI is like a refined Brahms concerto, you know, he's, he's a pope to be experienced over brie and white wine, you know, uh, and Francis is like, uh, what, Latin funk uh, with a little bit of salsa sprinkled on top, you know, um, and uh, in service to the same mission uh, as the successor of Peter and in service basically to the same teaching and so on, but very different accents depending on personality. Uh, substantively, uh, you know, I've always thought in terms of the narrative around three popes, in each one of their cases, it could be summed up in one three word sound bite. With John Paul, it was be not afraid. Uh, he inherited the church at a period in which it was perceived to be kind of moribund uh, after the internal culture wars of the Second Vatican Council and after what was perceived as the fairly depressing denouement uh, of the pontificate of Paul VI, kind of lost and adrift. And he wanted to take the church by the scruff of its neck and, and pull it up off the mat and put it back in the game. Uh, and he was profoundly convinced that Catholicism could change history in the here and now. And, and obviously, the subsequent story of his papacy confirmed him uh, in that assessment, right? I mean, with the collapse of the Soviet Union and all of that. Uh, you know, Benedict XVI, his three words were reason and faith. Uh, you know, he was, as everyone has said, this very cerebral figure. And I, I think he wanted to, it, you know, he, he wanted to teach this global graduate seminar uh, about the proper relationship between reason and faith in a postmodern secular democratic world. And if you take those great speeches, London, Paris, Berlin, uh, and even the Regensburg speech, I know none of us ever got around to reading it because we all tripped over the opening line, but uh, those four speeches together are a kind of four volume work uh, about the relationship between reason and faith that probably in graduate seminars 100 years from now will be read uh, and studied and unpacked. Uh, and then with Francis, now, unfortunately, his three words are in Latin, but, it, but it's his motto, 
miserando atque eligendo, uh, which is a little hard to translate, but basically it means choosing through the lens of mercy, right? Making decisions on the basis of mercy. And his entire papacy in some ways can be understood as a, an attempt at a policy application uh, of that idea. Uh, and I'm not sure any of these guys ever sit down and like on a cocktail napkin crafted this as their narrative. Um, but I just think circumstance, personality, uh, drive, uh, you know, they, they do have clearly different narratives. Uh, we have time for probably one more question uh, before we need to bring this plane in for a landing. And again, if you could please identify yourself and then ask the question. Yes, my name is Yuri. I'm from Ukraine and I'm a student of uh, this faculty of Holy Cross. And uh, thank you for your, for your words and for your sharing of, of, your, um, of your thoughts. And uh, obviously you, you know well the Vatican, but do you still uh, are knowing well your public? What about your readers? Who are they? And are they changing for, for the distance of these years and kilometers? Uh, so it's, it's very interesting for me, thank you. So John, so Shine, you don't exactly work for a particular news agency and you, you can't readily identify one particular readership, but just in general, in terms of the audience for stuff about the Vatican, do you notice anything about how, what it is today versus what it was 20 years ago, 30 years ago? But I do travel a lot. Huh? Um, the organization you, you mentioned at the beginning, CREC, the Center for Research and Education and Communication, we offer seminars, workshops on media and communications in different parts of the world. I spend a lot of time at the Catholic University of Ukraine in Lviv, where I teach communications. Um, and in Africa and Latin America and Asia and so forth. So I, I am meeting with Absolutely. people with potential readers, listeners, media consumers on the ground. Um, and precisely for, for the reason you, you, well, one of the things you spoke about earlier, uh, the, the diversity of, of resources that there are out there, the, 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 the growing dichotomy that there is in the world, um, politically, religiously, socially, culturally, um, th there is, there's a tension that there wasn't before. Right? There was a, 30 years ago, whenever, there, there was something called a middle ground. Uh, there, were, there was a golden mean, there, there was a point of convergence. There was something, a point where we could sit down and talk about things in a rational, reasonable way. That's becoming more and more difficult. Um, you have to take a position on the one side or the other, or you're simply not credible. And that one side or the other seems to be moving further and further away from the other. So yes, the tension and the need to, to take a position, huh? either on the, I don't like using terms like liberal, conservative, left or right, but I know you know exactly what I'm talking about. Yeah, I mean, that would certainly be my experience to, to answer your question. You ask, who is our audience today? I think the main difference is that when I started out, there more or less was an audience. I mean, you could talk about, you know, I, I've always written or broadcast mostly for a Catholic audience in the United States. Um, the English speaking world generally, but in particular, the United States. Uh, and when I started out, there was something you, you could talk about literate Catholics, uh, people or professional Catholics, like people who taught in universities uh, or who ran Catholic institutions or who worked in parishes, worked in chanceries, uh, or were active in their parish and had an interest in church affairs. And, and yes, there was left, right, and center back then too, of course, but there was this sort of sense that there is still a common base of facts and we're kind of interested in knowing what those facts are. And then we can disagree about what they mean, right? Uh, whereas increasingly today, my sense is that that kind of common audience is passe, it doesn't exist anymore. Um, so there is a kind of audience for, uh, one particular perspective on things, and there's an audience for another particular perspective on things, and kind of never the twain shall meet, right? 
Uh, so there are many, many, many people, for instance, uh, who would rely upon what the Associated Press publishes uh, about the Vatican, but I certainly know people who would never read the AP as an article of faith because A, because you're secular uh, and therefore untrustworthy and B, because you're perceived to be liberal um, and therefore there's a built-in bias and, you know, uh, and on and on. Um, and increasingly, uh, as, as Sean said, I, I, I do think it is becoming difficult to try to uh, what? Uh, either bridge that divide or, or defy uh, that, that kind of culture. I mean, in a way, Crux was born seven years ago as an experiment in precisely that. Uh, we wanted to see if there was room in an increasingly tribalized market. You know, we talk about polarized as if everybody's clustered on the left or the right, but in reality, it's more specialized than that uh, because within the liberal world, there are also huge fault lines mm -hmm. and the kinds of people who will read America wouldn't read the National Catholic Reporter, the kinds of, you know, and on and on and on. Uh, but anyway, uh, you know, the, the idea was, is it possible to carve out a space uh, in which that logic doesn't apply? Right, uh, and in which we're simply trying to present the story as much as possible without filter and without ideological uh, preconceptions and without telling you what you have to think about it, right? Um, and, uh, you know, I mean, to some extent it has been a success. I mean, in the sense that we, we have been able to carve out space for ourselves on the market and so on. Uh, but on the other hand, I, I will tell you, I mean, I remember at the beginning, for instance, we had this idea. Um, that in addition to our news and analysis, we also wanted to have an opinion section on the site that would give voice to varying points of view, right? And we thought we would get credit for balance by having, you know, a strong conservative voice on something, a strong liberal voice on something, and a more sort of moderate take on it, right? And what we discovered is that all that accomplished was making everybody mad because the conservatives were mad, we published the liberals, the liberals were mad that we published the conservatives and both the liberals and conservatives were mad that we published the moderate, right? Uh, and, you know, so I, to me, that's the issue. I mean, you're asking, I know you just really meant who is the audience for, for Vatican News, but I think it's a question almost a metaphysical one that, that has great relevance for journalism these days, which is, is there an audience mm -hmm. for journalism? Or what, are we really looking at a landscape of multiple and often competing audiences that are in effect redefining the nature of the industry, right? Um, and I, I think that is something worth thinking about. Mm -hmm. Nicole? Last word. Um, I guess uh, for me, my audience, the, the audience of the AP is is very different. It's, um, first of all, it's very international um, uh, and it is not specialized. It is not a Catholic audience. It is entirely secular and we have no idea who it is really. I mean, I, I think the, the tagline that I have to have on my email address is that over a billion people consume AP content every day in the world. So that's, you know, that's a pretty big audience. Um, as a result though, I think, um, you know, I'm, I'm somewhat immune, not, not entirely immune to the ideological tug of wars that a more specialized audience um, might, uh, that I might be aware of. I obviously get, get that in my Twitter feed too. Um, but I think um, the Vatican beat, uh, and I wouldn't even say necessarily with this papacy compared to others. I mean, it is a celebrity beat. We have a celebrity that we cover and it almost transcends religion. I mean, when the Pope is on the road, that's a top story for the AP. And it's not because of the gospel, you know, of the day or the homily that he delivered. It's because he's a celebrity and he draws attention. Um, and that's why the Vatican wants him traveling because they want somehow that the ultimate message is going to trickle out because the lens is on him, uh, even in the mainstream secular media. Um, so, I think I don't. I have no 
data to back this up, but I think a lot of the audience is interested in, in that celebrity quotient, in that that funky old Vatican. What are they up to? Um, the scandal, yeah. Um, but so beyond the the actual religion, um, there there's a lot that a lot of people will will gravitate to, um, and the. I think what what I try to do and what my colleagues here try to do is to present the the news obviously accurately, fairly, without the baggage that can spark those tug of wars. Um, it's funny, John. You said that AP is seen as liberal. I mean, I get slammed for you know being in in too tight with the traditionalists. Oh, so sure. I mean, I mean, it, it goes any 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 way depending on who wants to read it um, um but I, I i do think a lot of the interest in what we do is is because it is so unique and almost the the faith and the religion is is takes a second a back seat thank you nicole all right we have to bring this conversation to a close um, Nicole mentioned that this is a celebrity beat. We do have a celebrity we cover, and that's uh, Pope, well, at the moment, Pope Francis. Uh, we've had other celebrities, John Paul and Benedict. Um, but uh, we have today been in the presence of two other celebrities, um, because I'm telling you, in my world, Nicole Winfield and Sean Lovett, I am not kidding, they are rock stars. Uh, and we have all been privileged to be able to listen in today. So can I ask you to join me on a round of applause for my colleagues? And for you, John. And for you. I'd just like to thank uh, all three, and John also for moderating uh, this conversation that I think has been uh, very thoughtful and, and stimulating. And I thank all three of our journalists for, for sharing their reflections and their experience uh, with us today. Thank you very much. I should also add that uh, for those journalists who are, are viewing this, uh, remember to save the date for next year's um, Church Up Close session, which should be in person. That means coming here to Rome uh, the 12th to the 17th of September, uh, 2022. Thanks so much. fantastic opportunity for me to see the the workings of the of the Catholic Church in its in its heart and its headquarters in the, the Roman Curia um, and it's, it's it's a glimpse behind some walls that we wouldn't normally um, get to see behind from from a distance Absolutely, the program was conceived really well it really seems to address a lot of the issues that the press is really concerned about with this pontificate so far. So it's great to have some insights that you don't get otherwise they're not so easy to access. The point is I never expected that the people will be so open to all the questions that as a Muslim I wanted to know. I've been able to hear directly from major church leaders about the kinds of news that we're going to be covering in the next year uh, in this really interesting time in the church, but also just being able to be here in Rome and be saturated in these ideas, that's been incredibly helpful.